three, two, one, live. Good morning, everyone. We will wait uh, with your permission two, three minutes for uh, anyone who still uh, wishes to join and then we're going to start. So please bear with us. Okay, why won't we start and uh, hopefully anyone who wished to join us by now was able to do so. So, um, uh, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to uh, our GRN uh, meeting on uh, an interesting and important um, topic. Um, let me um, say a few words uh, before handing over to uh, Emerita, uh, a dear friend, Emerita, seated friend and a friend of all of us uh, who are here in the UN community uh, to lead the conversation. Um, but few words about the meeting and how it uh, fits with the CTC overall agenda. So for those of you who are uh, less familiar with the GRN, the GRN was established in 2015 by the by the CTC with the purpose of supporting CTED's work in uh, several important areas. Um, CTED, as uh, you may know, has a mandate to identify new trends. Um, the specific topic of today's meeting was a subject of two trend, trends reports, and it's an opportunity for me to thank uh, my colleagues Dave, Farah, and other members of the CTED team who supported uh, their work. In Resolution 2395, the Council asked CTED um, to strengthen its relations with the GRN, the Global Research Network, for two purposes. <clears throat> First, to support its work in the identification of trends. And second, the Council also recognized CTED's role in advising the CTC on practical ways for member states to implement these resolutions and reiterates the importance of working with relevant partners in this area, including through the GRN. So for these two purposes of identification of new trends and supporting the CTC uh, work in developing and finding practical ways for member states to implement the resolution, the GRN was established and supports since then the work of the CTC. And the main work, the main way, in the, when, the main way in which the GRN supports the work of the CIT, of CITED is by allowing the CTC and CITED to get direct access to research, to independent research, research that is done by some of the best minds in the field, and can offer the CTC and the CITED both identification of new trends as well as practical ways for member states to implement. The meeting today is on a new a new a new, a new um, um, topic for the CTC, but not a new topic at all. And those of you who are enough time in the field know that uh, the challenges of extreme right wing have been with us for many years, but it's clearly a growing concern and a growing concern for the CTC 
So we decided to hold this Friday uh, a first of its kind open meeting on this challenge. And the purpose of the meeting today is to support the work of the CTC by allowing it to add, get access to the latest in research in the field. Like support the work of the CTC. We would be happy to hear from researchers today how the extreme right wing actually operates. What is their modus operandi? Is it same or different than other forms of violent extremism? How do they cooperate internationally? How they are financing their activities? What CVE measures, for example, have proven themselves effective for this kind of a new trend? One of the most effective tools dealing with terrorism in, in general is just designations. But we have very little experience of designations of extreme right wing or as they call sometimes racially and ethnically motivated terrorism. And we want to learn more how designations uh, in this in this field have been proven to be effective or not. What can we learn from ex from other experiences in designations? There are also there are also other important questions. What gender they man the man dynamics we see in this kind of new trend? How do they operate online? And how do we exploit new technologies? And finally, what human rights principles should guide us in all this? All these questions will be the main theme for the CTC meeting on Friday. And the purpose of the meeting today is to offer the CTC members, as well as others in the field, some of the latest in research relating to these questions. Hopefully, it will allow the CTC to have what we all hope for is a policy based on the latest in research, evidence-based policy. This is the purpose of the GRN. This is the purpose of this meeting. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank the speakers. And I want to thank you, Emerita, who I don't think really needs introduction. She's uh, known to everyone here uh, for leading this conversation. So thank you, Emerita, and over to you. Thank you so much, David, um, and, and and thank you for those welcome remarks, and thank you to everyone for joining. It's really nice to be back in this uh, UN uh, diplomat community. I miss it so much, uh, and welcome uh, to today's Global Research Network Roundtable on extreme right, right wing uh, terrorism. It's an it's an issue that, as David mentioned, is not new, um, but is you know new and, and being taken up in this in this forum, which is which is incredible and fantastic. Uh, my name is Emerita Torres. I'm the Director of Policy Research and Programs at the SUFON Center. We're a nonpartisan strategy center dedicated to increasing awareness of global security issues in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, we take pride particularly in our ability to look beyond the horizon and identify trend lines before they become fault lines. And one of those fault lines has been transnational white supremacy. As you might be aware, at the center, we've been studying this topic since 2017, and we've been sounding the alarm uh, through our policy research and our analysis on the growing danger of this threat. We've now published three major research papers, including a detailed uh, research report on the transnational nature of white supremacy extremism, as well as two deep dives into particular organizations, uh, looking at the Russian imperial movement, as well as the Adam Waffen division. Through our daily intel briefs, we have also covered ongoing trends uh, related to the white supremacist threat, uh, including how COVID-19 and disinformation have exacerbated the threat. We're also proud to be here uh, as a founding member of CTES Global Research Network, which, as David mentioned, brings together global thought leaders from across academia and research to discuss the challenges that we face and to propose solutions around pressing uh, terrorism issues. So we're here today because we know terrorism is evolving globally. Extreme right-wing terrorism is a transnational challenge. Its tentacles reach from Australia to Ukraine and Norway to New Zealand. Uh, but it has evolved at a different pace in different parts of the world. Uh, CTED's April 2020 trends report highlights a 320% rise in terrorist attacks over the last five years by groups and individuals specifically affiliated with extreme right-wing movements and ideologies, which is a startling figure and it's, and it's why we're here today. It is worth mentioning uh, that there are many forms of violent extremism, including uh, terms that we'll use, I think, interchangeably in this conversation, including the extreme right, uh, extreme right wing, white supremacy extremism, 
racially and ethically motivated terrorism. So we we really do lack a common operating definition. So I, I imagine we're going to be jumping back and forth today on that. Uh, we do have a very impressive group of panelists with us today to help us navigate the dimensions uh, that David mentioned uh, regarding the, the threat that we face, including its global nature, the ideologies, how these movements radicalize and recruit, the gender dimensions of, of this threat, financing, and more. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to give you all a few notes on the format and the rules of the road. Uh, first, we're going to do a tour uh, toward the table, and so each speaker will be providing seven to eight minutes of remarks in their particular area of expertise, as you've seen in the agenda. After remarks from all of the speakers, we're going to open it up for questions. You're going to see in your Q&A console in uh, Microsoft Teams uh, where you can pose the questions. It looks like a little, uh, a little square box. Uh, and I ask that uh, kindly if you can be brief in your question and pose an actual question because we have a lot of people and a lot of, of great speakers to, to uh, answer your questions. Um, I will try to take as many questions as we can. Uh, and we may also collate some of the questions if they're on the same topic. And we're going to take the questions at the very end. But throughout the discussion, for example, after the first presentation, after the second presentation, feel free to start putting in your, your questions into the Q&A. So uh, we're also at the end of the discussion. Uh, check back in with our panelists for some final final thoughts. So with that, um, let's get started. First, we have on our list Dr. Kasper Rakowick, who's going to be discussing the internationalization of the threat. Kasper is an associated researcher at the Counter Extremism Project and an external associate fellow at GLOSEC in Slovakia. Kasper has 15 years of professional experience working in counterterrorism, preventing violent extremism, and the violent extremism right. Uh, since 2014, uh, he has been monitoring the extremist uh, foreign fighters uh, and that threat in Ukraine and how it's currently involved over time. Uh, and he's also working on a research endeavor with the counter extremism project on these fighters in particularly their pre and after war lives. And Casper is also a great friend, so it's nice to be with you. Casper, the floor is yours. Thank you for that, Emerita. Thank you to all who are listening in and who are here with us. Thank you to UNCTD. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to be here with you and I'll try to be as, as succinct and brief as possible. It's a massive field. Uh, I'm glad uh, both opening speeches included the phrase that it's a, not a new issue to deal with, to address. Of course, certainly this is how we feel here in Europe. By the way, very good afternoon to you from Bratislava, Central European time. Uh, so I have two points really uh, that I wanted to make as a kind of like an introduction and one is very short uh, which will lead me to a lo lo longer one which you probably already see in your sc on your screen. So essentially we're working with counter extremism project now on a report that tries to map out and flesh out the transnational connectivity of the extreme violent extreme right wing scene and this is how I will refer to uh, to these individuals and these groups and this milieu uh, throughout my throughout my presentation. And uh, while doing this, we basically wanted to make clear to all who will be reading and to all who will be listening that first point that we need to we need to I think remember and understand and appreciate. And sometimes, I mean, I have a problem with that while talking to other Europeans is that such a movement exists, that the transnational violent extreme right wing movement does exist. It's been long in the making, despite the fact that it's supposedly nationalist, parochial, regional, provincial to some extent and then supposedly you should be seeing a lot of nation versus nation peculiarity versus peculiarity rivalry you don't see that now it's hard to pinpoint the moment when this has actually started we can go very we can go back uh, to at least the 1930s and certainly to the battle of moscow which the german wehrmacht actually lost and since then the nazi germany reminded itself of the fact that it's actually a european country and then it might need some european help to defeat the soviet union so you might go as far as back you know 1941 really then there are some attempts in the 1950s and the 1960s 60s with the young european movement where you have basically strings and bunch of individuals who are no longer nationalists in the old sense, they are nationalists in the new sense. They're finding new common ground, new teams to actually fight the same enemy. And the enemy is not a nationalist from country A fighting a nationalist from country B. And essentially, 
this has been evolving certainly since then, but it obviously got accelerated definitely in the 21st century. And I will not be walking you through that because that's something that maybe we can take address address that in the Q and A uh, Q and A session. And certainly, this is something that, from a European perspective, definitely accelerates after 20, uh, 2015 and the so-called migrant migrant crisis. In a way, you are now left with with a movement which is reaching new horizons, which is defining a new enemy, so to speak. It's no longer nation versus nation. It's another races. It's the Muslims. It's the liberals. It's the feminists. So a very transnational enemy, so to speak. An enemy, I put it in inverted commas, and I was told not to do a lot of hand movements on Microsoft Teams, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try to minimize these. So essentially, it's a movement which is bound by hatred of new enemies, different enemies, the transnational enemies, and in, in itself, it's a transnational movement. And as such, it introduces new players into the field, and I'll be talking about that in a second. So it's different also in its lack of traditionality, that it reaches new grounds, it breaks certain barriers, and it reaches new 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 platforms, so to speak. And I, by saying platforms, I don't just mean online platforms. I also mean national platforms, if I could put it this way, or new ground, new new territories. Now, there is a string of things that definitely uh, that definitely is common to most of the participants of that very very movement. And I'm really simplifying things here, but trying to portray it uh, as, as as best as I can. So essentially, as I said, this movement is fueled by common narratives. Narratives of white genocide, narrative of great replacement, narrative of a kind of a new world order or the X, you name it. Any of these phrases, you put them in inverted commas. And this is something that the movement is waiting for. So it's either fighting an enemy that is working towards the destruction of the real white and, and good people as they see it. Or this is a situation in which the movement tries to accelerate a certain situation in which through a civil war or a global war, the world that they are they all wish for or most of them wish for will finally come come to being so it's no longer french versus german british versus german french versus british it's a completely different uh completely completely different different ball game and in this sense it's way way easier for them to actually coalesce around these these teams you know it's no longer like the congresses of the fascists of the 1930s where they would all argue whether is it National Socialist Germany or Fascist Italy that we like more? And then the Congress would basically split. It's a completely different situation now, in a sense, although they do argue with one another. I'm not trying to convince you that they don't. And here is the hope for us. Now, another thing which basically binds them is the divided we stand approach. You know, this is as much as they love uniforms, marching in ranks, uh, you know, uh, torches, armbands and things like that, this kind of militaristic approach. They do accept the fact that different nationalist, as they call it, nationalist, but extreme right wing scenes will be org organized to a different level. So you have political parties, you have groupings, grouplets, organizations, you have gangs, you have informal associations, etc., etc., etc. And depending on the country, you do have a different take. So essentially, you do have a different rooster of people within that very scene, and they accept that. That's not you know, shun the, you know, it, it's nothing to be, to be, you know, to be shy about. It's nothing to be worried about. The fact that you have a different form of organization and you slightly speak a different language than me, it's not such a very issue at the end of the day, as long as you hate the same enemy as I do. That's the approach. The third issue is that the movement has certain national inspirations and we identified four. National inspirations meaning points of reference. In a sense, there's always been Anglo-Saxon points of reference because of the language, because of some of the writings, because, because of the communication with, amongst them, which is mostly conducted in, in English. The Americans and the British have a head start in this sense. That's, that's how it's always been. And people do look up to them. It's a kind of, you know, Hollywood approach in a way, if you don't mind me saying this, that, you know, you always look up to, to, those, to those big brothers across the, across the ocean to check out what they're wearing, what they're saying, what they're reading, what they're doing. Even though you might not be really uh, appreciative of their operational skills, you will still be checking out uh, this, this yourself. Another experience, obviously, is the Germanic one. The Germanic one, everybody looks, to, looks up to Germany because Germany, in, the way, in a way, from their point of view, started off this business. And everyone wants to hang out with the Germans. And the German violent extreme right-wing groups are probably some of the most in, you know, interconnected transnationally around the globe. Everybody comes over to visit, visit them. They send emissaries abroad. It's a really, you know, trans, you know, transnational business in this sense. The third element is the Nordic element, the sagas, the Vikings, the imagery on one hand. 
On the other hand, you know, you have a group called the Nordic Resistance Movement, which is essentially the quintessential transnational violent extreme right wing group because it is transnational. It's not Swedish only, although Sweden dominates there very much. It's also Finnish. It's also Norwegian, Danish and well, Icelandic maybe, but you know, in a in such an order 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 of appearance. And this is an organization that is also looked up to. This is an organization that is praised. This is a, this is an organization that's often mentioned, despite the fact that it's a political party and it runs in elections. And theoretically, everybody should hate it for the fact that it actually plays around with democracy, but they don't mind. And I'm taking you back to this issue of the divided we stand. And the final new kid on the block, so to speak, is the Eastern approaches, the Eastern new members who have a seat at the table. So what Emerita mentioned, the Russian Imperial Movement, for example, and the Azov movement from, from Ukraine, which basically fought a war in the name of their own you know, distinct nationalisms. And they're basically saying, hey, we fought a war. What did you do? We want a seat at the table. We are the real guys. You know, what is it that you've been doing for the last decade or so when we were actually, you know, fighting a war and lying out there for nationalism? What did you do? How did you contribute, contribute to the cause? And the effect of that is that you have plenty of people that I study almost on a daily basis who come over to train, to liaise with Ukrainian and Russian groups. And I just stress, it's not only Ukrainian. You know, there's a massive Russian uh, Russian field there to, 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 to be looked at that actually claims a seat, a seat at the extreme right wing table, something that 10, 15 years ago would be unthinkable. That would be truly, truly, truly unthinkable as everybody was looking towards the Anglo-Saxon Germans and the Nordics. And, you know, I'm a Central Eastern European myself, and I'm a, I can tell you that 10, 15, 20 years ago in this milieu, no way would anyone take Poles, Russians, Ukrainians, Czechs and people like that seriously, because, well, we were the kind of, you know, the lesser mentioned, you know, to some extent. And the last point is that these individuals do travel to the same hubs. They have same travel patterns. They travel to the same rallies, marches, festivals, MMA, fight, MMA fights, MMA tournaments. Of course, COVID restricted that to a certain extent, but you know, come 2021 and certainly 2022, this will be back with a vengeance. This is where you meet, this is where you network, and this is where you recruit people from outside of, you know, outside of your milieu, people who, go, who, who flock to the MMA fights, People who go to those to those festivals who might not be members of your party, of your group, grouplet, etc. But nowadays they might be attracted to it on the back of something, something completely, completely different. So I'll stop there. Those two points. Uh, there is a transnational movement. It's changing. It's completely different from what we thought it used to be. And there are certain certain elements that bind it together. Thank you very much. Casper, thank you so much. I always always learn something new when you when you present on 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 your expertise. I think you, there's a lot to unpack there. I think um, a couple of points. Looking at the transnational movement against a transnational enemy, it's the first time I heard it sort of that way. Uh, and also, I mean, you mentioned a lot of the the ideologies and and what. Uh, extreme right wing or white supremacists are, are going after, whether it's great replacement accelerationist theories, uh, this us versus them mentality, and, and even how you talked about uh, how, how you dissect the movement, looking at the layering from you know political parties all the way down to the provincial level. So really, really fascinating. And then um, this leads us to a great segue to our next speaker, because you talked about the travel patterns and the hubs and radicalization and recruitment. So I'm going to move on now. Uh, to our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Catherine Thorlifson, who will be discussing radicalization and recruitment. Catherine is a researcher at the Center for Research on Extremism, or CREX, at the University of Oslo. She holds a PhD in anthropology from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, her chief interests lie in anthropological approaches to the study of nationalism and the far right. Uh, she has conducted a wide range of research uh, of the extreme far right and ethno-nationalism, including ethnographic fieldwork uh, in the United Kingdom, Norway, and Hungary, among other countries and contexts. So thank you, Catherine. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear and see me? Hello? Yep. Yep. Great. Perfect. So thank you for this opportunity to engage in uh, this knowledge exchange. And uh, the background for my talk today is the extraordinary period of white supremacist terrorism we've seen in 2019. Uh, the Christchurch massacre inspired further atrocities in the US, in Germany, in Norway. And although these white male perpetrators in their 1920s acted alone, they were radicalized in digital subcultures. So today I will address the ideas that drive this new pattern of right-wing terrorism, 
what drive radicalization in digital subcultures? How do activists derive strength and direction from offline events? And also finally, the challenges for PV CV policies in this field. Now, in terms of methods, I have the past year and a half examined the visual culture in the image-based message board of 4chan, as well as interviewed activists to understand what drives them to join and support an online extreme rights community. Now, since the founding of 4chan in 2003, users have been quite early adapters of digital communication technology. In more recent years, they have been at the forefront of online hate and disinformation campaigns, as well as real life violent escalations of internet cultures. Now, the users are geographically scattered with half of the users based in North America and the rest in Europe, Australia, but also countries like Brazil and Russia. So although, of course, uh, nationality can be manipulated online, it's still uh, an indicator that this is a very hyper-connected international milieu where white supremacist ideology is co-authored and circulated quite fast and anonymously in calls for violent action. Now, the fascism emerging at this uh, platform relies heavily on memes to express views, and the memes are eclectic, like all kinds of fascism, containing a flow of signifiers from alt-right, white supremacist, gaming culture, as well as popular culture at large. Now, anti-Semitism indicated here with the post number seven, the happy merchant meme, is the master frame and by far the most prevalent form of online racism at this platform. Now, the young men I've interviewed, they viewed Fortune as a digital home, a, a space for communal belonging, for negotiating masculinity, a space for escaping constraints of liberal community and to find support for alternative styles of selfhood in a counterculture centered on provocation, transgression, trolling and so-called shitposting. And emotions are to be controlled in yourself and then exploited in others. So in short, this platform offered my informants a sense of actually brotherhood, they use that term brotherhood and power that kept them quite hooked. Now, white supremacist beliefs, they, they enter this play frame and these beliefs are then amplified and repeated inside a quite closed ideological bubble or, or system. And this lends itself to what I term contagious fascism, describing the process through which white supremacy imaginaries are produced in these embodied processes of recruitment and belonging. Now, my colleague mentioned the migration crisis. Now, this image here started circulating in 2015 at the height of the so-called refugee crisis, because these environments, they respond to crisis. And five years later, you see COVID-19 crisis has led to the rapid reconfiguration of new anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, claiming that globalist Jews, that um, Bill Gates, George Soros, are using the virus as a bioweapon to obtain world dominance and control. Now, other mobilized established anti-Chinese tropes claiming that COVID-19 is a bioweapon developed by China to destroy the West. And it is evident that these racist conspiracy theories interact with all their tropes at the core of their anti-Semitic ideology. Now, the radicalized Annans present themselves as heroic men willing to protect white male Western supremacy. And their goal is to accelerate violent societal collapse that will lead to their decide race war and then eventually to the restoration of racially pure societies. And the frequent reference to kill score point to a wider trend from this online milieu, the gamification of terror. The attacks are to be executed, scored and circulated like a video game. And reducing victims to numbers and rating terrorists and circulating graphic images of the atrocities become integral to the emotional desensitization to violent acts, but also to the act of terror transformed to heroic masculinity and status. So Tarrant's, Tarrant is routinely praised. Tarrant is routinely praised in calls for more, uh, more, more violence. Now, the Annans themselves or the users, they do not analyze attacks as a single isolated event, but as an interact, interconnected ongoing action. 
Now, in terms then of CVE policies towards an anonymous, leaderless, transnational milieu, this is inherently challenging. I think it's important to address these root causes. Why do young men in the West violently reject the system? And these are not a classic losers of globalization, but often middle class men with existential frustrations, anxieties, where an ideology with clear enemy images that still maintains the space for creative agency can appear attractive. And also to limit exposure. Now, so we know that white supremacy propaganda matters in radicalization processes. We know that activists rapidly shift terms and symbols to avoid detection as they move across platforms. So this necessitates efficient cyber governance and cooperation between states and tech companies. And then also digital literacy. So young people born in the 90s, they grow up on social media and we need them to teach youngsters how to challenge dehumanizing discourses and conspiratorial thinking about ethnic and religious minorities and to avoid the heroic status of terrorists. And that's the responsibility, responsibility of the media that should not reproduce propaganda packages and avoid sensationalist coverage. And we also know that these far right digital subcultures derive strength and direction from critical events in real life. So national and supranational governments does play a critical role in safeguarding human dignity and democracy during crisis. And this entails strategic communication, both to curb the spread of disinformation and enhance trust in science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was very, very informative. I think you, you touched on a lot of really interesting points. One one that we've actually covered at the center quite a bit, the convergence of disinformation, conspiracy theories, COVID-19, and how that's played into the white supremacy movement and, and radicalization and recruitment. I think also uh, you mentioned the platforms, 4chan, 8chan, uh, and gaming. Um, I certainly think that's an area that uh, we don't focus on enough. You have 1.8 billion people on, on gaming websites. That's prime, prime ground for young people, young men uh, that you've talked about uh, who are who, who may very well be recruited into some of these leaderless uh, movements. And I'm going to turn it now over to uh, Dr. Matthew Feldman, who's going to talk about uh, the, the phenomenon of lone actors. Uh, Matthew is the director of the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. He is a specialist on fascist ideology and the far right in Europe and the US. He has long researched the history and the evolving nature of radical right movements and has taught these subjects for over two decades as a professor. Uh, he's also an emeritus professor in the history of modern ideas at Teesside University. Uh, he is also a visiting professor at Richmond and the American University in London and has authored and edited uh, several books on violent extremism. And I'm also happy to call uh, Matthew a friend. So Matthew, the floor is yours. Matthew, please unmute yourself. Sorry, technology and I are not old friends, I apologize. Um, I was just saying that I'm joined here by Dr. Natalie James, who's our head of counter extremism research unit at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. And I'm really just gonna focus down on something that is a little bit more narrow than perhaps talking about the, the wider issues. And that is what I'm calling self-activating terrorism. And I use that phrase instead of lone wolf terrorism, because that is a sort of valorizing phrase that suggests something almost desirable. Um, and there we see a picture of, of the, the worst perpetrator of uh, solo actor terrorism, Anders Bering Breivik, who, as many of you will know, on the 22nd of July 2011, killed 77 people in two locations in Norway. Um, most of those were killed on Utoya Island, some 69 uh, mostly children shot at close range. So it really um, should, should emphasize uh, exactly how deadly uh, solo actor terrorism can be. We also see with the Brevet case that um, in a number of instances, the radicalization towards uh, a terrorist act, sometimes called the terrorist cycle, can in fact be months or even years in the making. So that is the backdrop. And uh, the one point that I just draw attention to here is the second point. One of the things that we're seeing in the so-called terrorist cycle, and that is target selection, target surveillance, rehearsal and deployment, attack and exploitation, is that the internet has become an absolutely indispensable tool. 
Brevik himself bragged that uh, in starting what he called his explosive phase of research, he merely Googled around for two weeks. And I think that that's something that we really need to take seriously in terms of the counter extremism space, because what we're seeing is terrorist manuals available literally two or three clicks away. What I want to do really to try to uh, emphasize the way in which so-called lone wolves or self-activating terrorists, it really is the modus operandi for right wing extremists. You'll forgive me of telling a story from two years ago. And I hope that the the um, the story itself, we won't get too caught up on specifics. It's very specific to America, but that some of the generic points that we can pull out from this story will help us to understand the risks that we're facing from solo actor terrorists. So I start in the lead up to the midterm elections in the United States on the 24th of October 2018. Some people may be aware that Gregory Bush, a 51 year old uh, racist and uh, white supremacist, entered a Kroger supermarket and killed two African Americans in Kentucky. When he was confronted and approached by a, another armed person who happened to be white, he said, "What? don't shoot me, I won't shoot you. Whites don't shoot whites. Uh, we also know that only two days later, Cesar Sayoc Jr. was arrested after sending some 16 explosive packages uh, from everyone to CNN and Robert De Niro, right the way through to President, then President Obama, Hillary, excuse me, then uh, ex-president Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden. This was somebody who we might call uh, sort of a tea party or sort of fringe of the conservative movement. Only the next day, we saw Robert Bowers in an infamous attack, one of the largest uh, hate attacks we've seen in the United States history, entering the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and killing 11, injuring seven others. He was, ad, uh, he was advocating a, a stop to the so-called migrant caravan apparently coming up, or that he claimed coming up from the South to, uh, to invade the United States. And importantly, the last thing that he said was, screw your optics, I'm going in. And as we saw, absolute carnage at the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, really only hours later. And finally, a shooting in Tallahassee, Florida on the 2nd of November, again within this two weeks, this was military veteran Scott was shooting six women, killing two. Now, this was somebody who was part of the so-called involuntary celibate movement, a uh, larger part of the so-called manosphere, and as somebody who, as an ex-military veteran, uh, was increasingly radicalized against interracial relationships and really uh, in a kind of violent misogyny that led to this uh, appalling act of terrorism. What all together from this little story, first of all, is that I think these trigger campaigns that we see where, where there's a sense that it is absolutely life or death for you, for your community, those can be political, uh, as we see uh, coming up in a, a, any large election around the world, they might also be psychological as well. But these trigger events can be positive or negative and can lead to these individuals basically inducting themselves into a one person army and going from there to uh, basically cause destruction on an innocent populace at large. I mentioned the role of the internet, but if we just look to the third point here, what we saw on these slides, one was a sort of reactionary Ku Klux Klan type white supremacist. Another one, we might talk about radicalized conservatives. Um, the shooting at the Tree of Life was a classic anti-Semitic hate crime uh, uh, perpetrated by fascist, even neo-Nazi extremists. And what we saw with the incels was online extremist subcultures. What I want to suggest is that these are four very different faces of the radical right. The only thing they seem to agree on, you put these four people in a room together, they will not agree on much, save the fact that solo actor terrorism has been the go-to political violence tactic for at least a decade. Uh, the decade largely opened, as we've heard, with Anders Bering Brevik and closed with 51 people murdered uh, at Friday prayers uh, in Christchurch. New Zealand. But scholars have been saying this for a long time. So-called leaderless resistance is becoming the modus operandi. That's George Michael in 2012. Uh, only this year we've heard C-Rex, where Dr. Thorleifson is based, say lone actors carry out most of the violent solo actor terrorism today. Scholars are really speaking with one voice here, saying if you want to talk about the nature of right-wing extremism, we really have to talk about solo actor terrorism. I don't have time to get into it here, but one of the things that's important is that experts are only now identifying the proper trajectory. And you can see it there in red, solo actor terrorism actually dates back to the 19th century, so-called propaganda of the deed. We can leave that there, but I think 
that what is absolutely essential is that this started in 1980 in the United States. It wasn't Louis Beam's so-called leaderless resistance, which first appeared in 1983 and really uh, was circulated only from 1992. It was James Mason's argument in Siege and the nature of these sort of Sam and Zach texts that were circulated in the United States that really started this phenomenon of individuals basically declaring war on their own society. There you can see one statement from James Mason in 1980, can we see another one that I'll part read? Hit on the would be better to turn the up to run and hit. And he goes on to say, at that point, you can go ahead and do and get away with any damn thing you'd like to do. There you can see James Mason's 2015 and 2017 edition of Siege, which collects these texts from 1980 and 1986, and really was the catalyst for what we're calling Siege culture. And that is a kind of small cell or even radicalized individuals associated with the Sonnen Creek Division, Adam Waffen Division, and others who really are all about lone wolf terrorism and targeting innocent people. As we can see again, 10 years ago, Anders Bering Brevik had already realized this. The conclusion is undeniable. This will be my last entry. Only 90 minutes later, uh, he let off a bomb in Oslo that killed eight people. Here you can see he's actually spent the time teasing out one person uh, in his 30 day step by step day by day uh, uh, list of how to con construct a terrorist attack um, emphasizes absolutely without doubt that one person is necessary. So just to conclude, one of the things that we have seen, um, really starting with David Copeland in the United Kingdom in 1999, is a takeoff of this terrorist tactic. It's a promiscuous terrorist tactic. There's no chance that it will simply be only right-wing extremists, but so far they've cornered the market and we're still thinking in very 20th century uh, ways about how to tackle what is an inherently 21st century problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Um, very, very compelling presentation. I think um, so much to unpack there as well from the history piece, which I hope we get to in the Q&A at least. I think the history piece and, and, and James Mason and all of that is so, so important to understand the movements that we see today. Uh, and the four different faces. That's the first time I've seen that uh, those different sects broken down. Um, and we've seen a lot, at least uh, in the U.S., that last sect you mentioned, QAnon uh, and, and, and other groups and the in these online extremist subcultures. Uh, and then finally, I'll say um, the risks of apprehension, really interesting as you as you make the argument around lone, lone wolf terrorism or what, what you call self-activating terrorists, which I'll, I'll try and use that <laughs> moving forward. Uh, but you did mention uh, a great segue looking at misogyny, incels and the gender dimensions of of this threat. So I'm going to turn now to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Pearson, who's going to be discussing those dimensions with us of, of the extreme right. Elizabeth is a lecturer at the Cyber Threats Research Center at Swansea University, specializing in gender and extremism and online and offline extremism. She has worked with Vox Paul, the EU's online extremism network, uh, research network, and has conducted research on gender in ISIS supporting communities on Twitter. Elizabeth earned her PhD at King's College London. She explored gender in both Islamist and far right movements in the United Kingdom. She's also an, an associate fellow at the Royal United uh, Services Institute, or Rusi, and has carried out research examining attitudes uh, to both violent extremism and countering violent extremism in the UK, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Canada. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, and I hope that everyone can kind of hear me okay. And I think after that introduction, thank you, we, we can just move to the next slide straight away pretty much, because I want to use this 10 minutes to make sort of three points broadly about gender and the far right. Um, and the first is that we're thinking about homosocial groups, so numerically dominated by men, then thinking about gender has to mean thinking about relationships between men and women, thinking about power and thinking about masculinities, which some of the speakers have already touched on today. The second thing that I want to sort of point to is that when we look at gender, we see far right groups, and this is the problem of the umbrella term, are not all doing the same things, leading to gendered tensions between them. And the third point summing up is that this challenges some of the ideas we have had about gender and the far right and the kinds of responses that would be required. 
So the talk today is based on field research from 2016 to 2018 in the UK with radical right activists. So my definition is that it's people who opposed Islam and what they understand as the Islamization of the UK and the West. These are not terrorist actors, they are extreme actors. And I spoke to supporters of three movements, if we have the next slide. So these are Britain first, um, the English Defence League, and um, the Sharia Watch political activist Anne Marie Waters. So, this is UK based research, but these actors have transnational links also. As a warning, I'm obviously discussing views which are offensive to many people, which I do not agree with, and we will see some of those views in some of the transcript a bit later on in the presentation. So, first of all, Gender, why is it relevant? Because it means thinking about how power operates in these groups. And as I said, it means thinking about relationships between men and women. And there's already a lot of work on gender and the far right over the years, looking at women also looking and thinking about masculinities. And authors have outlined the ways in which gender is important in shaping ideology, for instance, with far right groups often promoting a very clear division between men's and women's natural roles. So this is what Ashley Mathias, who's worked on the alt right, has called gendered complementarity. So groups can have a maternalist agenda promoting pride in women's roles as homemakers, men's roles as breadwinners and protectors of women, particularly as mothers of the white race and sexually vulnerable to outsiders. So essentially here we're talking about who has power and how power is exercised in far right groups and for what aims. We know that far right groups tend to be numerically dominated by men, and it's therefore important to use a gendered analysis to really unpick and understand this, thinking about ways of being a man, what brings status in particular group cultures and what does the opposite. And to do this, we can think about masculinities. What does it mean? Well, it means ideas about manhood relational to femininities, enacted according to a hierarchy. Um, if we look at groups and cultures, we can see certain masculinities or ways of being a man are subordinate to others. So that brings me to the second point, and that was about tension and fragmentation. And if you look at masculinities, then you can see that even between groups that broadly do the same things. So in this case, I was looking at radical right groups. They agree on Islam as an unassimilable ideology. They agree that it's oppressive to women and they frame the state as favoring immigrant Muslim populations as sexually predatory, even though they're sexually predatory over indigenous populations. So I was broadly interested in the three anti-Muslim groups who are doing that. Britain First, political party with Jada Franson as the deputy leader at the time of research. The EDL English Defence League, this is a street movement founded by Tommy Robinson, and a series of protests under the banner Islam Kills Women, led by Amory Waters. So, looking at masculinities, gender was working in different ways to shape their activism and in ways that were not straightforwardly consistent with the complementarity of traditional far right groups that I outlined a moment ago men as protected breadwinners and women as protected. They had three different approaches to gender. So Anne-Marie Waters, who's pictured here, Anne-Marie Waters explicitly asserts women's rights and gay rights, she's a gay woman, as central to her project. She's promoted women's equal participation while still rejecting the label feminism, and her demonstrations attracted more women, and she in turn attracted abuse from other parts of the far right because of this. She told me a lot of opponents of Islam have views that I don't like, and Coulter thinks women shouldn't be allowed to vote, and I don't want those people to be the ones speaking out against Islam. She found the alt-right social media backlash to women's equality extremely frustrating, and she'd suffered online abuse from alt-right men who, as she said, want us back in the kitchen. That wasn't her position. In the next slide, you see Britain First is something else entirely. It promotes itself as a Christian group using military symbolism, flags, military band music to promote a culture of what it sees as disciplined, proactive military masculinities. And in the past, Britain First battalions, so-called, have organised mosque invasions, so-called. Jada Franson presented this as a complete contrast to alcohol-fueled, chaotic EDL demonstrations, which she felt didn't get anywhere. 
You can see Jada Franson here leading marches, encouraging women's participation, putting them at the forefront, but essentially she wasn't challenging patriarchy in the group. She told me she enjoyed being part of a male dominated organization. She enjoyed being a symbol of resistance because she's associated by Britain First members with Boudicca, organizing resistance to Roman occupation. And um, at one event, she endorsed a speaker who was talking about women and people of color having broadly lower intelligence than white men. In the next slide, you see uh, the English Defence League, um, which is another contrast again. The English Defence League celebrates what it frames as a nationalist, working class, kind of muscular masculinity to which other masculinities, particularly liberal, white and Muslims, are sub subordinated. So EDL masculinities belong to pre-existing cultures, they're, they're not extraordinary. There's, they're drawing from uh, particular forms of white working class culture, football culture, drinking culture, a culture of casual violence to some degree. Um, and as the next slide shows, a street culture also in which um, masculinities are kind of forged in this shadow of a possible permanent threat of violence, which prompts particular physicalities, particular ways of being men. And these masculinities could be seen in, in men's behaviours, confrontation, aggression, sexual prowess, but also women involved in these groups because they were seeking status and place there too. And as you see in the next slide, um, participating in some of those masculinities also brought, brought risks um, as descriptions of women who were EDL angels. So the EDL was patriarchal, it was asserting men's protection of women, but it was doing other things as well. It was mobilizing assertions of women's rights and equality as abused by Islam. It was encouraging women's activism, even if this was only a minority of demonstrators. And even within these kind of cultures of casual violence, um, they were trying to develop a narrative of male care rather than one of male protection. So you could see this, for instance, in Tommy Robinson videos showing him crying publicly or hugging sexual exploitation survivors. It's obviously not wholly successful, given it's really unclear to what degree these narratives are simply being cynically co-opted. So. In the next slide, what, what does it mean and, and why does it matter? I'm just going to go back to the sort of kind of key points. So mobilisation around women's equality narratives and women's active participation, as happens in the groups that I was speaking to, means that the traditional separation of gender roles in the old far right, women as these protected mothers and men as protected breadwinners, is, is a bit more complex uh, here in these groups. So perhaps Britain first resembles this kind of old dynamic uh, more than the other groups. And it's made activism and participation for both men and women more complex too. As I pointed out, women activists could face pushback if they challenge men, if they challenge masculinist norms, promoting men's dominance. They also face pushback if they emulate men and the masculinities around them by demonstrating aggression or, or um, taking part in casual sex as men in the EDL did, or just asserting their independence from men's protections. The masculinities here were also not straightforward. Just as women are doing masculinities, you know, there's space for men to show a greater range of masculinities than just aggression or strength or particular forms of heroism. And the differing masculinities in the cultures evident in these different groups, beliefs and values, um, they also structured men and women's activism differently and the relationships between them. So it's created tensions and fragmentation between the groups and there was movement between them as a result. It had practical outcomes. So most importantly, I think for uh, thinking about responses, if gender is a point of tension between these groups um, and they're not all doing the things, then one size fits all kind of gendered responses are not really going to work when thinking about um, the far right. It needs to be disaggregated. And equally important is the recognition that if you think about gender in the far right, then you need to think about men and women and those power relationships and dynamics together. Um, and you don't want to sort of separate them off for one another. So thanks very much um, for um, your time and uh, listening to this presentation. And I look forward to um, discussing this further later in the session. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I mean, talk about the complexities there. I think you broke down a lot of these topics and I have a lot of questions. I have probably more questions than than anything else that hopefully we can get into in the Q&A. But looking at, you know, this and I think we talked a lot about this back when we were studying, we continue to study the role of women in Salafi jihadist groups and the varied roles that they play. I think, you know, in, in this case, we see a lot of complexity, a lot of complexity around either the active participation of women in these movements, their their passiveness in some of these movements um, and, and the gendered roles and traditional stereotypes that we see. So so thank you so much. I'm going to move on to um, our last uh, but not least speaker, uh, also a friend um, who's going to talk to us about how all of these movements get finance. We talked a lot about how white supremacists and, and extreme right wing terrorists are traveling around the world. How do they do that? How do they acquire weapons? And I can't think of a better person uh, to talk about that than Tom Keating. Uh, Tom is the director of the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI. His uh, research focuses on matters of the intersection of finance and security, including the use of finance as a tool of intelligence and disruption. He has a master's in intelligence and international security from King's College in London, where his research focused on the effectiveness of the global counterterrorism finance regime. Thank you, Tom. The floor is yours. Great, uh, Amrita, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dave and co for um, inviting me to, to join you uh, today. I, I um, I'm, I'm the last one to, uh, to to speak, and I've been listening and learning a lot from uh, from everybody else because I think the issue of the financing of these groups is uh, is really uh, nascent. Um, we took it upon ourselves at RUSI uh, beginning of last year to look at this issue and published a, a short paper in the the RUSI uh, journal, um, which reflects many of the sentiments that others have have expressed. So the, the self motivating nature of the of the threat is important when thinking about finance um, and also thinking about it from a 21st century uh, perspective. Uh, often the response when we think about terrorist financing hasn't really moved on uh, from the, the time of 9-11. Of so I was pleased to hear that. Um, and I think it's notwithstanding the, the history that, that Casper laid out for us at the, uh, the beginning, um, there are not a lot of people who have really, I think, taken the time to look at the, the financing. It's a, definitely an emerging uh, issue. Uh, and so, as I say, it's really good to have the opportunity to um, talk about that today. And, and ultimately, this conversation is about about trends. And I, I wouldn't mind uh, betting ex banker that I am that uh, a trend that we will observe in the coming years is a, a greater focus on the on the financial issue because that has, in recent years anyway, become the kind of one of the go to responses for policymakers faced with this kind of um, threat. Um, and I guess it's also worth recalling when we think about financing in the context of extreme right, which is that you know, for the UN and for the global community, um, combating terrorist financing has been a you know, core pillar of the global response to terrorism since 9-11. Uh, you, you, you can't move, or at least in the old days, you couldn't move for invitations to terrorist financing conferences. Obviously, um, UN Security Council uh, resolutions, uh, most recently an important one in the form of 2462 last year uh, and then obviously countries are periodically subject to the pretty uh, invasive uh, public scrutiny of the financial action task force and and the, the less public scrutiny of uh, UN um, CTED and so that's something that over the last uh, almost 20 years we've become very uh, very very used to uh, but obviously what we re would realize very quickly if you look at this topic is that uh, almost all the study of threat financing has been limited to uh, the jihadi uh, threat and, and obviously that would be short-sighted given the threat landscape that others have just um, uh, laid out uh, for us. Um, and, and although there is definitely a, a limited amount of information uh, available with regards to uh, fundraising for, for the extreme right, um, obviously in an environment where there is increased collaboration uh, online, uh, this will without doubt extend to financial uh, support across national boundaries just in the way uh, social media and other forms of, of contact have allowed ideas uh, to flow uh, across, um, across boundaries. I think what's clear at the moment, at least from what we um, uh, discovered, was that the flowing of funds is not explicitly for for violence. There's little evidence of that in any sort of systematic way, but more for kind of general support, um, you know, recognition of, you know, we're, we are we are kind of united in what we're doing and, and 
that sort of donation and also uh, legal support. Some um, uh, cases in the, the past of, uh, for example, um, uh, Liz mentioned uh, Tommy Robinson, uh, you know, he received funding uh, from the US for to support him in uh, court cases in, in, in the UK. So, so yeah, funds are clearly flowing uh, across uh, borders. Um, so the question then is what what can we do? Uh, what should we be, be doing if we're sitting here trying to figure out uh, how to, to move ahead? Um, so uh, Matt, Matthew uh, talked about self-motivating actors. There's been a tremendous study uh, of loan actors and small cells uh, uh, and their financing as relates to uh, actors linked to jihadi groups such as uh, ISIS. We should definitely be drawing on, on that learning um, because many of the uh, right-wing actors that we're talking about have sort of a similar desire to op op uh, operate outside mainstream society or at least kind of below below the, the radar. And so uh, pretty clear evidence that they are using similar fundraising sources such as the abuse of state benefits and social security systems, definitely using their, their own uh, earnings uh, and indeed uh, fraud. And then some uh, idiosyncratic uh, methods of, of fundraising through you know, the sale of merchandise or uh, music concerts are often uh, uh, referred to. And then uh, some uh, emerging evidence of the abuse of, of charities. Um, again, Liz referenced the um, kind of some Christian uh, links or, or, or attempted links. Uh, and obviously the use of charities is something uh, perhaps in different capacities, but we're familiar with in other areas of terrorist and extremism uh, financing. The frustrating thing, I think, in all of this is that we in theory have the tools uh, to tackle this form of financial activity. Um, but and, and I don't make what I'm say what I'm about to say just as an academic point. Uh, there is the whole question of definitions in in all of this. Um, and obviously where a group is designated as a terrorist organization or, or an individual is designated uh, as a terrorist, then that unlocks a raft of responses that a, a state can use when it comes to financial disruption, asset freezing and all those other tools that are available. But in many countries, uh, the extreme right threat isn't deemed to have crossed the terrorism threshold. Uh, and for whatever reason, um, uh, governments have, have, have chosen not to grapple with that issue uh, from a terrorism uh, perspective. And so those responses uh, are not um, uh, un unlocked. So the question then is how can we grapple with the financing of this threat if we believe that the financing of this threat should be uh, tackled? And so one approach that we're definitely seeing um, emerging, um, and I don't know whether this is purposeful uh, negligence on the part of governments or, or otherwise, but it's definitely convenient for governments who are uh, struggling to define extremism within their laws, is engagement with the, the private sector, specifically financial institutions for whom taking action um, against people using their services uh, does not require that individual to be designated as a terrorist. They can purely uh, make that decision at their own whim uh, so they can justify it along the lines of reputation rather than um, uh, the, the, the law of the, ter the, the terrorism law of the land. And so how are we starting to see that emerging? And I think we are starting to see that emerge um, more and more, certainly um, uh, in the UK and, and other uh, kind of Western financial systems that that, that I've had exposure to. Um, you know, it's traditional to talk about information sharing and, and public private partnerships, governments and financial institutions coming uh, together. I think in this case, what that means is educating financial institutions as to uh, what what to look out for as relates to extreme right activities. So uh, there's been some really good um, work done amalgamating uh, symbols and words and numbers that are um, relevant to uh, the uh, the extreme right. You know, banks love numbers uh, for obvious reasons, but when they are screening transactions, if they you know, if they know that certain profiles might be using numbers um, to uh, send indications to to e each other, you know, the, obviously the number 88, uh, 88 is very popular, for example, uh, that can help um, uh, financial institutions that want to conduct investigations into their own data to see if they are banking people that they feel they should rather not want to be uh, to be banking and identify perhaps you know, concerts that are being held for extreme right fundraising reasons uh, rather than just um, musical uh, enjoyment. So just to I guess to conclude I, it, it's definitely an emerging area but it's definitely an area that I or we at Rusi certainly would argue deserves um, greater uh, attention. 
Um, there is a, a whole oeuvre out there on, on threat finance more generally, and I think it would be good for uh, that the, those working in those areas to turn their attention to the uh, extreme right. Some policymakers obviously are aware of the importance of paying attention to the financing of this this threat, and I'll just kind of end with the, uh, an observation from um, a statement that was put out by Treasury Secretary uh, Mnuchin in the United States after the events in Charlottesville in 2017, where he said um, that uh, he'd use his office to use all the powers and resources of the Department of Treasury's terrorism and financial intelligence units to combat and stop terrorist financing domestically and internationally. And I suspect given the time of his statement when he said domestically, he wasn't just referring to jihadi based threats in the United States, but also uh, extreme right. So I will end it there, Amrita. Thank you all for your time and I look forward like everyone else to the questions. Thank you so much, Tom. It's a great way to end it. You know, uh, when when you discussed you know that quote, but also thinking about the tools. We already have the tools. We've deployed these tools against other terrorist groups in the past. Uh, so I think it's a matter of deployment. Um, and and you also uh, what I what I thought when you were when you were talking about some of the work you've done and in, in your insights. You know, uh, money laundering, abuse of charities. These are patterns that we've seen in the past. Um, so again, I think part of it might be political will. Part of it might be uh, understanding the tools and actually deploying those financial tools. So now um, we've reached uh, the end of presentations. Really incredible presentations. Thank you so much for for all the speakers. We also have quite a few uh, questions. So I'm going to do my best uh, to go through them and and to collate them. And thank you to. To, to, to Dave and Farah for, for their help on this. Uh, why don't we actually saw a really interesting question that can help us uh, kick things off. And I, I'll try my best to, to point them in the right direction of, of the panelists who I think has that the expertise, but if not, please correct me and then we can we can move. Um, I think this one will go to, to Matthew. Uh, what evidence is there that solo actors are coalescing or is this phenomenon deliberately maintained by those operating within the extreme right milieu? I suppose maybe I'd, I mean, it's a really important question. Depends on what we mean by coalescing. I really want to stress that solo actors are logistically going through the terrorist cycle themselves. Otherwise, we may as well just throw out the term. So coalescing does, absolutely stops at the door of logistic preparations to the terrorist, one solo actor terrorist. However, what we see on especially some of the smaller platforms, and they have digger, bigger prob different problems than the bigger platforms, some of the smaller platforms, including the gaming platforms, really don't have the kind of uh, ability to take down, to moderate some of the content. And what we get is a lot of like-minded people on things, probably one that uh, was in the news, was like Terror Wave. That was the one that everybody had its kind of moral panic about. The fact that there were only 30 or 40 people on that site kind of goes out the window. Are these people who are sharing like-minded ideas and they're finding each other online? Yes. Are they also radicalizing and encouraging each other? Yes. Can the internet be used to, as part of the terrorist cycle, for sourcing weapons, weapons conversions kit? In fact, the first case that I worked as an expert in this area, uh, somebody had managed to, by themselves, make a weapon of mass destruction. They had literally manufactured a dozen lethal, lethal doses of ricin. So we really need to, I think, catch up and we need to understand the separation between an individual going through the terrorist cycle alone and at the same time, a what I might call a network of support, a like-minded community that exists online and is much more useful to right-wing extremists than having a buddy who lives down the street. The fact that these people might be in New Zealand or Canada or anywhere else is irrelevant. So that's a really important point um, on the network of support, especially with, with the internet and online, you can access that network from wherever. Um, great, thank you. Uh, next question, I think I'm going to direct this one to Casper. Uh, beyond the movement of people and ideas, are there increasing signs of international organizations taking shape or any centralized or institutionalized hubs emerging? Without the organizational profile, what kinds of international responses can best address the threat? So maybe I'll start. Thank you, Emerita. I'll start from the back, so to speak, how to address the threat, because I think uh, uh, we could talk a lot about disrupting things, and I think there is a nice chance of actually disrupting these individuals by actually going after their convergence points. So they do converge, as I said, on certain, you know, instead physical points. So they go to certain rallies, they go to certain fights, they go to certain festivals. And if we, and I mean mostly Europeans, were able to address convergence points for football hooligans, who are far more numerous, 
Okay, far more loud. They're not politically organized. They're on a completely different different wavelength to a certain extent. But you know, elements of how they organize and how they roll, if I can really use that phrase, uh, they are really similar to what we see in this scene. And I'm not saying the most sophisticated actors, but quite a few do move about, move around in the same manner. And if you were able to ban people from traveling, if you were able to ban certain events, we can go back to the designations that you mentioned. This is one way of stopping it. Now, that's obviously a short answer in the, to, to, to this massive, massive question. But I would start, you know, Matthew quite rightly spoke about the, you know, 21st century threat. But I think this is a very 20th century solution. But I think we cannot forget the 20th century solutions to that, you know. So you really go after those, you know, you treat them as, as football hooligans, really. And that will help you sometimes, not with everything. And of course, I admit with it's with more the organized groups. And you asked about the organized groups. Yes, there are. I mean, the fact that the loners, so to speak, were the most prolific uh, in terms of violence and in terms of casualties from this milieu in the last few years or historically, I mean, I'm risking it now. I don't have the data right in front of my eyes. Does not mean that the organizations didn't try. You know, you have organizations right around in Scandinavia, France, UK, uh, USA, which try to stage spectacular terrorist plots or not so spectacular, and they usually fail because they're organizations, because they're easy to infiltrate, uh, they are easy to break, you know, break up in this sense. So loners on one hand, and on the other hand, you have those organizations. So if someone's asking, are they organizing? They're already organized. It's you don't hear about it that much because they thankfully fail. But they do try, just a snapshot from France, plots to kill President Macron, a plot to kill Minister of Interior. Well, you probably haven't heard of these, but they were actually put together by, well, sort of organizations from the extreme right wing milieu. Thank you, Casper. Really important uh, points that you made. I'm going to direct my next question to Catherine. Uh, what are the measures that can be taken to control online recruitment and radicalization of vulnerable populations? Um, I think that's a very difficult question, but obviously one is the platforming of some of the actors, which you see already, already is being done. Um, the platforms I have studied, they are at the dark web or they are places where you anyways ghost because you know you will not be kicked off that platform. And I think that's a very attractive space for these young men because they avoid manuals, hierarchies and name names and leaders. So this is a more kind of transgressive and free space where you can play with identities and also play with terror, but at the same time have the order provided by by classical fascism in a way. And so I think, you, as I said, to address the root causes, why do we see increasingly young men from the age of 14 and onwards, from 14 to 25, who feel left out, not in necessarily in economic sense, but who fear these diversification processes, who fear or feel that they are being uh, displaced. And, and um, so to work with young masculinities in a way, and in issues of belonging, and of course also to um, to hinder um, the spread of propaganda because that matters. So to um, avoid uh, spread of white supremacy propaganda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, forgive me as I'm jumping around. I'm trying to make sure we all get an opportunity. All of you get an opportunity to speak on your expertise and feel free if you want to add a point, just raise your finger and I'll go to you. So feel free to do that as well. I'm going to uh, direct my next question to Elizabeth on, on gender. Um, has research been pursued in analyzing gender discrepancies in terms of women's participation and equality narratives between right wing extremist organizations slash groups characterized by greater societal presence and activism and the far right digital subcultures? So, sorry, the question, <laughs> the question, long question. The question is about narratives of equality in digital subcultures. Um, I don't know that about specific, there's plenty of people doing research on digital subcultures. Um, Ryan Scrivens, for instance, has done quite a lot of research on Stormfront. Ashley Mathias, who I mentioned, has been doing research online. Um, looking at women's equality narratives, I'm not so sure about. People have certainly looked at maternalist narratives, the importance of motherhood, the importance of um, women's identities that are pushed back as people have discussed to ideas of liberal feminism. So this isn't just about sort of protest masculinities. Women are also involved in pushing back in sort of protest at some of the um, 
some of the changes in society that they feel threatened by, that they feel have, have happened without consultation, um, for instance. So um, that specific question I know less about. I mean, there is a lot of research going on on the internet um, at the moment on the far right. There has been a shift to away from looking at um, partly to do with funding, looking at jihadism online, which was some, you know, mostly successfully removed from um, some of the key platforms because it was quite easy to identify. Um, there's a lot of far right material out there. It makes good data and it's hard to remove because it's really difficult sometimes to spot what's far right and what's just part of normal, what's become very normal discourse. The boundaries between these things are extremely blurred. There's lots and lots of research going on on where those boundaries lie. And I think that's a really important um, area for the future. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to read this question and then point your finger to me if you want to take it, because I think several of you can take this one. Uh, can any of the panelists speak to the role of religiosity, whether it be Christianity, Norse mythology, etc., as a component of transnational right wing extremism? Casper, go ahead. Yes, really quickly. Um, in certain cases, it is it is an issue. So you hang out if you're super Christian, you hang out with other super Christians. I'm really dumping it down now. I've seen it very much in, for example, in the French milieu from the extreme right, where they basically it's easier for them to hang out with other Christians along these kind of, you know, communitarian lines, even if they might be Catholic and the other Christians are Orthodox. There is a kind of sense, but I wouldn't say it's mainstream in a, in a sense that it's a mainstream of the global scene or Western scene, but I've seen I've seen instances of that, that it is a component and, you know, Christians better than well, than almost anything else, even though I'm, you know, there is a different, different, different sides and stories to this Christianity, if I can put it this way. Thank you, Casper. I'm going to go back now to Elizabeth. This is a really interesting question. I wonder how you would parse women's involvement in something like QAnon, which has become transnational and seems to cultivate a lot of support among women. How does this compare to gender engagement in other extremist communities? How might it impact the capacity of conspiracy driven movements to become violent? So I think that there's an interesting kind of perhaps an interesting assumption in the question, which is around why, uh, which is around stereotypes around women's support for and participation in movements on the face of it do not look like they have very much to offer women. And um, this this goes to the point around um, women's support for um, maternalist, uh, maternalist groups. Um, and I think, uh, so, sorry, is this just, would you just, Marissa, just mind rephrasing the question again, sorry. Sure, sure, no problem. Um, just give me one minute. Bear with me as I pull this back up. Uh, just have written it down. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. These are really great questions. Um, one second. There was something about con conspiracy theories. I mean, I, yeah. I, QAnon is not it's not my you know I, I've been looking very specifically at certain types of groups and again I think this goes to the disaggregation is you know I can be asked a question about what's happening in another part of, of what is broadly thought of as the far right and it's if it's not my specific area of research I think it's you know it's we can't make the same assumptions about, about what's happening in different in different groups and different subcultures because while there are um, shared aspects there are also much that is that is not the same. And these areas are all kind of, you know, ripe really for research. And I think this is also important when we're thinking about responses, because, you know, gendered responses to violent extremism are really sort of in their infancy. And just as the research is moving from jihadism and Islamism to, and research on the far right has been going on for decades, it just hasn't been going on under the sort of auspices of terrorism studies. As we're moving towards more research on the far right, we'll also be thinking and seeing responses perhaps borrowed from Islamism, borrowed from jihadism um, and applied to far right groups. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that not all of those responses have worked, particularly in gendered terms, and that they, when we're all the different groups that are being mentioned here, uh, mil militarist groups, online groups, misogynist groups, anti-Islam groups, these are all really different things going on. And we have to 
there are some things that they share, but many things that they do not. And I think that's mm -hmm. important. Thank you. I think you made a really good point that I was going to ask you anyway, which is how do you make these comparisons? So thank you for 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 addressing that. We've got a lot of questions on on financing, so I'm going to I'm going to turn to you, Tom, uh, for for this one. What countermeasures are being explored in disrupting the financing of right wing extremism or terrorism? Are the FATF recommendations UNCTAD 1373 sufficient to combat right wing terrorism or is new legislation or new approaches needed? Um, so start with the easy one. Um, the Marcus Player, the uh, new president, uh, the German president of the FATF in his objectives, uh, which were endorsed by the FATF back in July. Uh, he is including uh, in one of his objectives focus on e extreme right and other kind of forms of uh, of uh, uh, terrorism. But therein lies the challenge, because as I said in my remarks, um, so much of the international architecture is predicated on the word terrorism. Um, and I, I think where where certainly from what I've seen where we are struggling and, and it I'm sure will vary from country to country, but where we are struggling is marrying the architecture we have for disrupting threat finance, let's call it that, uh, and the laws that we have in place with uh, the threat that we face. So for example, um, you know, there is a legal requirement to freeze the assets of designated terrorists. Um, there isn't any way, um, uh, at least uh, along those lines, of freezing the assets of uh, you know, people from the extreme right. And so I think this is, we haven't really thrashed out this issue. And I think people who have typically just focused on um, on the issue of, of of terrorist financing, as I say, they've, they've grown up in the post 9-11 era, uh, most of them, uh, they've grown up in the post 9-11 era and uh, it's been a relatively clean picture. It's been an easy uh, picture to discern and therefore the responses are clearly in front of us. But I think the challenge now is if we think that targeting the finances of these threats uh, is appropriate, then how do we do it within appropriate legal parameters? And if those legal parameters don't exist, what do we do next? And then you get into a whole debate around the definition of extremism, which others on the call are far more um, uh, experienced at, at, at unpacking than I am. But you get in, I, I know from talking to law enforcement people that they are hamstrung because you know, certainly in the UK, there is no real definition of extremism. Um, and so how do you apply um, the, 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 the threat finance tools that we have? So it's a real problem, I think. And I think it's, I think it's a problem that is going to, uh, we need to address the problem, uh, you know, uh, quickly, because otherwise it's a problem that I think is going to haunt us if we're not careful. So there is much more to be done and not to say that none of the architecture we have currently um, is helpful, but uh, we need to have a good look at the existing architecture and figure out where the gaps are. I've just thought of a project for myself. Good. No, great points. Uh, I, I want to ask you just one follow up because it's, it's related and I think could be helpful for everyone listening. Is there a source that lays out symbols, words or numbers that are used as indicators between extreme right wing uh, individuals through financial institutions? So there are trends that you're seeing in terms of some of these transactions that are taking place. There is. And as I mentioned it earlier on, I thought someone's going to ask me a question for a source on that. So there are two, there are two and others on the, the phone might re remember the one that's escaped my mind, which is a, from an academic institution that came out recently. But actually, the one that I have found to be the best uh, and, um, uh, it, and if you uh, you can find it online is um, a guide that was produced by uh, the Greater Manchester Police actually uh, in the UK and for some reason it's online. Um, uh, so I, I recommend that uh, if you just kind of Google extreme right symbols and and trafford.gov.uk uh, you'll you'll find that. Um, but then someone else might remember and if I remember I will um, I will uh, come back to you with the name of the academic organization. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to direct this next question to, to Natalie. Uh, regarding young people, youth, and, and their involvement. Uh, so right-wing extremists, uh, as we now call them, domestic violent extremists, at least in the US, and Islamist jihadi groups 
tend to follow or have been following in some cases parallel playbooks when, re when recruiting children online. I uh, was wondering, Natalie, if you can talk about that a little bit. Are you seeing any trends, uh, whether in regards to um, how they're uh, recruiting? Is there any similarities, any differences? And, and what are some of the trends that you're seeing with right wing extremists uh, uh, attracting young people online? Uh, yeah, I can speak to some of that. Um, so we, I think the one of the things that's been picked up on by the other speakers is the the role of um, the online platforms that we're seeing. So whether that be gaming uh, platforms, whether that be things like 8chan, 4chan, Gab, um, there there is a real kind of a push towards where, and, and this is kind of where it gets an issue between perhaps one of the things that people have picked up and the difference between things like counter-terrorism and counter-extremism. Now, extremism and terrorism are two very different things, and this is where something like this comes really into the form of individuals uh, becoming um, sort of engaged in these platforms and becoming deeper and deeper involved in them, but they're not actually committing any crimes they're engaging in the conversations they're in you know they're, they're, they're meeting like-minded people um, and these narratives are bringing them in and are becoming uh, you know accelerating their ideologies that they're engaging with but because we don't have that kind of notion of what uh, particularly you know it was mentioned then that we don't have the definition of what extremism is especially here in the UK how we determine at what point that becomes dangerous that for that individual well we can't until they act but what we are seeing is individuals who are becoming kind of um engrossed in those spaces but also then tapping that into the mainstream as well is how that then appearing on things like facebook and twitter those narratives which suddenly don't seem that extreme to young people because they're becoming surrounded by it by fellow young people by people who are old. You're breaking up. Who perhaps are kind of quite vulnerable. Oh, sorry, we talk about vulnerability in the UK and um, this idea that people can be kind of uh, alone and be looking for sanctuary with other individuals and in these spaces. But it, it's not just about that, unfortunately, anymore. We are seeing, you know, people who. So my research, for example, I was absolutely flabbergasted by how many people who were what 16 17 years of age on these websites just because they've heard about them and thought it would be fun to look at them so yeah we are seeing a real mainstreaming of these sites and and individuals who perhaps don't fall into the, the typical definition of being vulnerable to these ideologies and they are being co-opted into them because it's becoming popular it's becoming something that's surrounded by them and their their friends and and people who they're then looking for to create these connections with Really good point on on the mainstreaming and how youth are just so susceptible these days to 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 some of this uh, that we're seeing online. Um, next question is for Casper. What substantial resources, financial or others, do you estimate uh, extreme right wing uh, extremists uh, right wing extremists bring with them to Ukraine, fighting on either side? In particular, people coming from uh, generally affluent areas uh, such as Sweden and, and and other more affluent countries. Well, they do bring their resources because their money from back home, whether it's a Swedish krona or, or euro or pounds or dollars, actually goes a longer way, so to speak, in either you know either side of the divide. Uh, but I don't think you know so far they've been mostly used as recruiters of other Western Europeans, to be frank, and they haven't been superbly prolific in bringing in financial resources from back home. Because actually, if you look at the state that some of the finances uh, of these organizations that they're coming from in the west what the state of these finances is they're not really you know great bankers but if you can go in and say hey i have a have an income from back home because i'm actually i've rented out my two flats in stockholm and now i live in mariupol in in ukraine or i live on the other side of the divide in donetsk well that helps so i think it is individual in this sense, but I haven't seen, but I mean, obviously, I would need Tom to help me out with that, but I haven't seen like, you know, the money trail going in that direction. I've seen these guys really begging for money. I've seen these guys embezzling one another, really. So, you know, there's like they put out a call for, for financial assistance and then one runs away and has, has a nice time in Montenegro uh, on the seaside. So it's not, 
you know, it's not mountains of money really that is being 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 moved there. Plus, please do remember that you're you're dealing with a Central Eastern European hospitality. So just you know, fly yourself to either Kiev or Donetsk, and all will be great and all will be organized for you. And to some extent, that's true. No, that's helpful. Actually, I have one follow up because we haven't discussed Ukraine uh, too much. So there's a, a, a good question here and maybe you can talk about this a bit. Any estimation on numbers joining Azov in similar groups for training purposes? That's a killer, that's a killer question because uh, the regiment that is mentioned uh, is being uh, touted right, left and center as this epicenter of, of, of all sorts of training for such individuals, which to some extent, I'm not sure that's the case because one thing is to actually hang out in their HQ, which is well pretty downtown Kiev, uh, to be honest. And another thing is actually to, to train with the regiment, especially after it got so much professionalized uh, in the recent in the recent years. So, I mean, I a brave person would put a number on this on this on the on this training. I think what we might try is to actually do a mapping of whom they met and where they went before the COVID hit. And I think this is an interesting comparison to see that, that they're actually targeting countries in which they think they can make inroads as far as competing with Russian extreme right wing nationalists who are coming in and also trying to lure certain Westerners into 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 their fold. So you see, you know, as of trying to go wherever Russians are unsuccessful. So that's an interesting dynamic that we probably have to map out and maybe hey, that's an idea for my next project. <laughs> this is a great forum for new projects. That's great. Um, so I want to reframe this question a bit um, and I'm going to throw it out to all of the panelists and just point to me if you think you can take it. How much success uh, have interventions focused on the traditional far away had over time? Like maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. And then if you can answer this question, um, how do those successes uh, compare or, or in thinking about new interventions with regards to some of the newer ideologies and subcultures that we're seeing, particularly QAnon, incels, 5G, et cetera. So if someone wants to take that. stab maybe um or if you can just discuss any any experience you may have had with interventions i know um there was this, a discussion in one of the presentations around uh grievances uh, like what are the grievances that some of these groups have and have there been ways that uh successfully that organizations have addressed some of these grievances you can also table it as something um to answer later that's fine Bear with me one second. There are many questions so I'm going to go through and see what hasn't been discussed. OK, this one I'll, I'll point to, to Matthew. Are there any trends of people being self-activated in countries where white people are the minority? Have there been any instances in which they have caused violence or formed groups? Interesting question. Difficult question. Um, most of the ones that we're talking about when we're, when we're looking at the new neo-Nazi groups, and again, I, we should step back. This is a very old problem. Uh, Right-wing extremism has been around for 100 years, of course, or, or more. And what we're only, the, the step change that we're seeing in the last 10 years has been the formation of these online subcultures. Iron March is the classic one. From within Iron March, National Action was launched, the Adam Waffen Division was launched, the Sonnen Creek Division, the Fire Creek Division, because they're a, a sort of clearinghouse for like-minded people. And after Iron March shut, Fascist Forge set up. And we will see another one that comes up before too long. These are things, and I think that here is where the danger and perhaps where the intervention are. One in two of those people broadcast their intent before they go out and undertake a terrorist act. Almost all of them are getting into things that are so extreme, for example, sadistic forms of Satanism, that you can recognize the behavioral change. One of the problems that we have now, and I think that this problem is magnified by our pandemic, but it isn't going anywhere, is that the internet has become more a part of our life over the last 20 years. And of course, is anybody going to say it's not going to become more a part of our life in the next 20 years? What we're seeing is young people almost invariably without the kind of supervision that we might see for you know normally teenagers in school or something like that, who are following it down the rabbit hole 
and are taking it upon themselves to say, we are soldiers now, we declare war on our own society, and we're going to target the most vulnerable. And until we start thinking either of small cells or individuals as self-appointed soldiers attacking their own societies, we're simply not taking this issue seriously. Thank you, Matthew, great point. Um, next question is for, for Catherine. Uh, Catherine, you mentioned the gamification of this issue. Uh, do you see any mainstream gaming cliches, such as where you often play as a, a white Western soldier in conflict, Call of Duty, et cetera? What are some of the, the trends that you're seeing? Well, as I mentioned, the most obvious is obviously the gaming references to kill count, how actually you dehumanize through the gaming lingo. But in terms of developing friendship, because these are not just lone actors, they actually develop quite strong friendships as well. And that goes through Discord and different um, different platforms where they meet and form actual friendships. So one thing is, uh, as I said, the trend of uh, entering a play frame of, of wrapping hatreds in humour. So the paradox of the play is that it, it's both serious and not serious at the same time. And that's quite appealing, something you can be drawn to as a teenager and very young. And then you start laughing of the dehumanized body. So one thing is gaming in dehumanization, and then it's gaming in the visual propaganda. And then it's also actual friendship on these gaming uh, apps. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. This question is for uh, Casper or Elizabeth or both. Are there examples of female right-wing extremists traveling to fight on either side in Ukraine or taking on any role, financial, recruitment, logistics? Elizabeth, maybe. <laughs> no, okay, so uh, I I'll say I'll say this. Uh, in terms of traveling to fight, uh, very, 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 very few. I think I've come across two or three, really. Uh, these are individual examples. Uh, in terms of prominence, well, that's a slightly different ballgame because, you know, an organization has been mentioned here. The Ukrainian organization Azov <laughs> movement has a pretty prominent uh, person in its ranks who's female, one person. And uh, it's pretty unique. She is being fielded as an ambassador of the movement and she used to work with another right wing extreme right wing organization in ukraine so 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 you know she's got the track record and then the street cred if i could put it this way deliberately speaks fluent english speaks fluent german uh, so obviously that tells you what the priorities what the priorities what the priorities are so i think as much as it's not been it has not been the issue of fighting it is an issue of you know propaganda uh, for sure, and I think, you know, on the Ukrainian side, you have the most prominent, prominent example. I would have to think hard uh, of equally others, which would be equally, 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 equally prominent. I saw Matthew and then uh, back to Elizabeth. Sorry, sorry, technology hates me. Um, just very briefly, I think Casper is absolutely right. And what we see in Azov, yes, there are some hundreds of foreign fighters, but they're learning how to handle weapons. And you don't need to travel to Crimea to do that. As Casper pointed out in his uh, really profoundly important overlooked, really the, the site for a lot of this stuff is mixed martial arts and different forms of, you don't need to travel to Ukraine for that. They're telling people to learn how to defend yourself. And it just so happens that a lot of those techniques can be used offensively. And there's two places where we're seeing that training carried out on a large scale. One is Ukraine or Eastern Ukraine, and the other is the United States because of the availability of weapons. Thank you for that. Over, uh, Elizabeth. I just wanted to make a, a short point about um, women and violence and um, women that I'd spoken to who are part of the radical right. So, so very, very different. Um, you know, at the, at the most, Britain first would have aspirations towards kind of paramilitary um, cultures, but they're not really partaking in, in those. But for a lot of some of the a, 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 a majority, sorry, of the women that I spoke to were the idea of violence was off putting. It was um, something that deterred them from more active participation in demonstrations so if they felt that there was likely to be violence which was an incentive to men's participation in some demonstrations where they knew they were going to come into contact with um, the far left with Antifa or with the police women would be staying away often and it was it was a deterrent and it was something that 
the possibility for violence was something that shaped that activism space. Um, so I, that was that was quite important. I just wanted to go back to something that um, has been sort of prevalent as well in the discussion, which is around age and youth radicalization. We've been talking a lot about the internet, but one of the things in the people and the sort of sample, again, it's a different set of actors, anti-Muslim demonstrators in the UK. Um, they weren't uniformly young and the kinds of people that were being radicalized and the kinds of, if we can use that term, radicalization that was happening and some of it online was, was not always of young people. There were people in their you know, 30s, 40s, 50s um, that were being drawn into some of these movements, either online or through friends or you know, in a variety of different ways. So I think although, especially with the jihadist radicalization, there is a tendency to sort of frame this as a youth issue. And I'm not saying obviously that certain, that youth radicalization is not an issue here, but in the groups that I was speaking to, there were also many people who are older who were um, becoming involved, men and women. No, thank you. Thank you for that point. Um, so this is an interesting question and you have to, I think, understand a bit about, you know, the UNCT framework to to, to answer this or maybe the, the framework of your own uh, country on the CT side. Can the CT framework, i.e. legal information sharing, financial frameworks, be adjusted for the issue of solo actors, loose affiliations, leaderless movements, et cetera. The lack of ability to link these people to defined foreign terrorist organizations limits the CT reaction so far. Can the current PCVE programs largely focus on the Islamic threat be adapted to extreme right wing? It's a really interesting question. Um, I'll throw it out there. Perhaps, I don't know, Matthew, you were, you were saying no, so maybe we can go to you first and then uh, we can jump around if those want to put their finger up. I'm happy to, to pitch in and say basically this is the purpose of this meeting. Basically, this is why we convened this meeting in order to ask those questions and make sure that the CTC in its meeting on Friday addresses uh, the challenges, the differences, the similarities, as well as the global response. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Yeah, I'm quite happy to jump in here. Um, the reason why Matthew was shaking his head is because I think that Matthew's in it, I'm in agreement with Matthew here that we, unless you separate the notion of terrorism from the notion of extremism, know they are not fit for purpose because those two things are incredibly different. Yes, they are linked. Yes, they can, you know, one can lead to the other theoretically, but they are two different things. And while we still kind of focus on this notion of preventing terrorism, we are not then going to be able to prevent this, these extremist dialogues, these extremist narrative, narratives and these extremist um, sort of ideologies that can lead to terrorism unless we kind of take a step back and see that as a very different thing. And we account for that within these countering um, CBE, CPB, whatever term you want to use for it, then no, they're not fit for purpose unless they do that. And they deal with it as two separate things as well. And if I could just add to that very briefly, my, my concern is very similar to Dr. James's, but it's, it's it also extends to this concern that I have about lots of very knowledgeable people hitting cut and paste from the 20 years of experience of dealing with Islamist terrorism. We're just going to keep going backwards when people hit cut and paste and they say these are the same problems. I'll give you just one example of where it's different. In Western white majority countries, right wing extremism sits, it abuts the mainstream. It is next to the mainstream. So you're not going to see terroristic material that gets immediately taken down like jihadi Islamist material because there is an appetite to do that. There's no appetite to do that for people who are abutting the mainstream. So if we're going to continue saying, well, we need to use this framework and import it from, from these understandings, we're going backwards. I'm really hopeful that we can go forwards. And going forwards does not mean copy paste, in my view. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would echo what, what Matthew is saying from um, from from my from my perspective, I think you know if if we want a an example of uh, of copy paste, it is I'm afraid the way in which back to I think original thing I was saying earlier is the way in which we've kind of uh, many countries have taken the terrorist financing or the counter terror financing requirements uh, in the immediate post 9/11 era and kind of rolled those forward. Uh, regardless of the shape of the threat that they that they face and that was the 
yeah, that was the outcome of a big study that we did at RUSI, which we published earlier this year, is you've got to understand the threat that you face and then craft the response according to the threat. Don't take the current threat shape mallet you've got and, and whack things and assume that it's going to work. Great, I know uh, Elizabeth, you wanted to please, please chime in. Yeah, so I think it really importantly on this and I because I get asked about it such a lot is, you know, you have this sort of framing of, well, um, the far right and Islamism, they're just two kind of manifestations of the same thing, aren't they? It's just these men who uh, feel really bad about themselves. If we can just make men feel good about themselves, they could go off and be far right. They could go off and be Islamists. And it's the same essential problem. It's about um, toxic masculinity. And I would say, actually, you know, I, I tried to outline differences even within one kind of, you know, one particular milieu within um, the far right. And, and I was also talking to Islamists in this research. There were many more differences between, and as Matthew said, you know, the relationship to the state, the relationship to mainstream discourse, the relationship to mainstream society makes those things extremely um, different. And people, uh, and people want to also focus on misogyny. Now, I, I absolutely think we need to focus on misogyny. You can't be a woman online and not know about, so you can't be a woman and not know about misogyny. But the types of misogyny, we can't just say, well, we're focusing on extreme misogyny or misogyny that's related to this neo-Nazi group, because misogyny is everywhere and it's at the, in the highest offices of power and it is reproduced and perpetuated in all of society. So I think we have to avoid kind of making some of the same mistakes and particularly thinking about, you know, particular men as toxic and divorcing this from what is happening all around us, the context to and the background to the the rise and um, appeal of some of these groups, whatever they are. So I, I would say, you know, be really cautious on the gender front about making assumptions about similarities uh, there. Thank you. No, I think um, really important point, points made by everyone, and especially given, you know, the, the session that will take place tomorrow on the CTC. I think this is a really important back and forth on, you know, in, in some cases, it, is it important that is it is it necessary to adapt some of the frameworks is it important to throw them out the window like we need to we need to discuss uh, these things much more much more in depth. So so thank you for those comments. Um, this question for Tom. Wondering if you can share some examples of money laundering patterns, if any, that you've seen in far right violent extremist groups. Uh, well, the answer is uh, none, and it's partly uh, because of a point I made earlier, which is that um, I, I think you have to st stop and ask yourself you know, why might, you know, what would money be used for here? Are we talking about criminal activity? to um, uh, buy a nice house or a yacht or what have you. Uh, I think in general, no, we're not. Um, uh, absent uh, Casper's point about running away for a nice holiday uh, at the beach, but uh, we're, we're not. Um, I think you have to think about what, what is the money being, being used for? Uh, and actually, we're not really talking about uh, money laundering for gain here. We're talking about having sufficient money to undertake, uh, to, to undertake life uh, and then at the appropriate moment uh, to, you know, to, to undertake whatever attack or get involved in whatever uh, organization uh, you, you might, that might interest you. So I, I don't, I think if you lay out um, the various different forms of, of terrorist threat and then ask yourself, how do those uh, finance themselves across the spectrum? Um, you know, the money laundering, uh, the money laundering, um, uh, typology only really covers certain forms of terrorism, certainly not this one. Thank you, Tom. Um, and, and sorry, just just one thing, just one thing on that. And if you are, you know, and if you're sitting there in a financial institution thinking, uh, uh, how do I combat this issue? I need to beef up my money laundering uh, checks. You know, you're, you're obviously going to miss it. Great, um, thank you, thank you, Tom, for that. I'm going to use moderator's privilege and ask a question uh, that's been on my mind, and that's uh, we talked a lot about the internet, online radicalization, um, and but less so on the role of the private sector internet companies and perhaps what they what they should be doing. So, wondering, I guess my first question is, what what are they doing well? I know it, as of late there have been some some serious takedowns with a couple of of uh, organizations, but moreover, what what could they be doing better uh, in this space? So I, I I give it to all of you. If there's someone who wants to take it first, please be my guest, Catherine. 
Well, all the groups we have talked about today, they differ in ideology and history and orientation, but we know that all of them, no matter what their age or, or background, they exploit digital technologies, both for recruitment and propaganda purposes. So, as I said in my recommendations, it's obviously key to, to limit exposure and that the big tech companies are up to date with detection because now these uh, in real time are constantly reinventing symbols terminology to avoid detection so better moderation and you know to criminalize particular groups and actors that have been efficiently done now at facebook that have kicked off both uh, proud boys boogaloo boys but then once actors migrate to different platforms like Telegram, they will have a smaller audience, but they, it will be still able to have them under surveillance and also to be up to date with, with um, detection and, and monitoring. Yeah. You can go ahead, uh, Matthew, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, and I think we need to understand the scale of the problem. I completely agree with Dr. Thorleaf that she really knows her stuff on this subject, but I would make the distinction between big and small platforms. Just to give you an example, the thing that has changed the record for the world on this has been the awful attack in Christchurch only 18 months ago. That uh, made this meeting possible. But let's remember the 24 hours after that Christchurch uh, shooting at two locations that killed 51 people, a video was uploaded, it was live streamed because terrorists can obviously use new material and in, in, in new technology in creative ways, horrific creative ways. That material, that video was shared 2.7 million times in 24 hours. That's because roughly one out of every two people on the planet has a Facebook account. We're talking about billions of accounts, 2.7 billion. In that 24 hours, 2.4 million were taken down. That is eight ninths of these videos of, of the Christchurch shooter. Now. I ask the panelists, I ask everybody, is taking down roughly 88, 89% of terrorist content a success or a failure? Because I don't even think we're equipped to ask that question yet. We're not even there yet. We haven't distinguished between big and small platforms. We haven't distinguished between signaling and responsibilities on these platforms, let alone what kind of financial penalty some of the big platforms might face for not taking down the content quick enough. So I've, I'm afraid, again, we're asking the wrong questions. Is 2.4 million out of 2.7 million a success or a failure? Yeah, I think just to carry on from that, I think one of the things that we need to do as well is, is perhaps equip these these companies, whether big or small, with the capacity, with the research, with the knowledge to be able to understand, you know, as Catherine mentioned, the, these changing signals that groups are using, their ability to adapt, their ability to respond, and extremely quickly as well. And, you know, they, I mean, CARB is going to be doing some work on this, um, so it will be something that we're able to come back to with a lot more information around this. But one of the things that we're trying to look at is around these issues of the definition as, as to whether or not these platforms can work with the definitions that we have and whether or not that needs altering to be able for them to be, be able to, to establish thresholds of where these will uh, events happen and require taking down. But we really need to be engaging with the ability for them to be able to respond to the far right, responding to their takedowns, you know, just changing an identity and appearing under a different handle in, in tw on Twitter isn't going to work because five minutes later after they've been banned, they're back on there again. So we need to be taking these things into consideration as well. And, and part of that is on us as academics and, you know, us as, uh, you know, yourselves as international organisation need to be providing this information. But they, the companies also need to be requesting this and be doing more to seek it out as well. Absolutely. I, I saw Casper and then Elizabeth, please. Thank you, Emerita. Really quickly on the on the big tech, uh, you know, the extremists that I monitor that went to fight in Ukraine, basically they are organized on Facebook because it was legal, because there was no sanction to it. You could essentially drop CVs to one another on over Messenger. They would be writing, you know, references to one another over, over Messenger, basically to, rec to recruit people to extremist units on both sides of the war. Now, uh, if that's not a breach of sorts, well, that I don't know what it is. Of course, we can go back to the discussion on how the company should know, but then if that very extremist is actually talking about that in an interview, end times, saying that I've recruited XYZ number of people over Messenger and Facebook, well, we do have a problem here. And, I'm, you know, let's not forget about that very, uh, that very issue here. Very important. Before Elizabeth, you go, I just want to let you know we have about uh, five minutes left. I'm going to ask as we close after Elizabeth speaks um, your call to action. 
So in one or two minutes, if you can tell us, tell, tell the group, what's your call to action on this issue? I think it'll be really helpful for our group, but also thinking about the session tomorrow. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, I'll be really quick because you can probably hear the Welsh rain is kind of, you know, invading now here as well. I just wanted to say in fairness to um, there are plenty of coalitions and collaborations in terms of tech companies. There's Tech Against Terrorism, there's GIF CT. You know, maybe they're not working properly. It's often a question of local jurisdiction, of private company. You, you know, th there are legal, there are regulatory, there are contextual, there are cultural problems ar around these things, as well as numbers and the way that tech works. Um, and it's really important to better understand the meaning of online spaces. How much of all the millions of terrible posts out there actually are going to pose a threat? Paul Gil done a lot of work on disaggregating online behaviours to be able to sift and see you know what is noise what is toxic noise and what is actually going to lead to something and I think you know that that's really important to mention my one key takeaway would obviously be that we need to think um, at all times not just people working in gender but everybody working on trying to think about issues of either extremism or of terrorism and they are very different um, even though they're linked often, is is to think about gender and to think about that in, in all its complexity and nuance. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so now just, just to let you all know, um, we had over 35 questions in the queue. We didn't get through half of them. So many great questions. So so thank you so much. And I, I'm saddened that we ended on, on the internet piece because I think there was so, so much to, to unpack there. Um, but I think I'll turn perhaps first to uh, Natalie and Matthew for your call to action, and then I'll just I'll move through the the circles that I see. Mine can be very straightforward and simple. We are not going to make any headway in this area until we start removing terrorist manuals from the main platforms online. As it stands, one can Google and find probably about fifteen or twenty different terrorist manuals that are explicitly right wing for the white resistance manual. There are many that go by this name. We are not serious about actually addressing this problem until we start going after the low hanging fruit. That goes for the internet platforms, that goes for GIFCT, that goes for CTED. Until we move away from you can actually get a recipe for making terrorist bombs two clicks away, until we get away from that, we really, uh, it's hard to see that we're actually doing more than talking about a problem that's getting worse. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll move now to Elizabeth. Oh, thanks for giving me another shot to say again. I think that we have to really, all of us, think about uh, about gender and think of it in not just as about women, but about power and relationships within within groups and uh, and you know and and really try to take a nuanced and complex approach. So repetition is everything. I think. It's the thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, Next, Catherine. Yes, I echo uh, the obvious in terms of limiting exposure, and this um, obviously necessitates um, effective cooperation between governments and tech companies. But in addition, I also would um, underline the importance of education and digital literacy for new generations, so they can detect these dehumanizing images, so how to have critical thinking to bust myths and conspiracy theories about migrants and uh, minorities. Very well taken, thank you. And then uh, last but not least, Casper. Uh, so I have two points. One is about, uh, one is the thing that I mentioned earlier. So essentially, uh, think low key. So think of these as a bit of a constellation of football hooligans and gangs, to some extent, of course, I'm not saying completely, and deploy the measures that you have deployed in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, to, to combat these internationally in the same in the same manner. And it to some extent, it will work. It will disrupt this 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 very milieu, and of course, on top of that, all the all the things that that have been mentioned earlier. But one more thing, everyone, uh, all the other speakers were in favor of not adopting the city framework for countering this very threat. I beg to differ to some extent, just to some extent. Uh, you know, I've been studying law enforcement structures all around Europe for some time, and I've met quite a few police departments in which, in room A, sits the counter extremism department, and in room B. Sometimes be on the other side of the wall, sometimes on the other floor, sits the counterterrorism department. And the latter chases the people who are not white, and the former chases the people who are. Now, we cannot be thinking of these silos. You know, the CT infrastructure does have some elements that could be used in this fight, although I do agree it's not 
to be copy, copied and pasted and it should not be the leading element of this of this verified, but you know, abolish the silos. Great point, and I'm so sorry, but you, Casper, you're not last but not least because we have Tom. I'm sorry, Tom, I didn't see your, your camera up. So uh, a, a couple of words from you, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would um, uh, echo something that Matthew said. I think we need to get ahead of the, the problem when we're thinking about the finance. Um, so expand the threat finance lens uh, from the, uh, the the focus uh, that it has right now on purely uh, jihadi based funding uh, and study the legal frameworks to determine suitability of current TF responses. I, I, I'm sort of halfway between Casper and, and uh, perhaps others. I think we have I think we have frameworks that we can use. The question is, um, can we kind of adapt them uh, appropriately? Thank you. Um, no, really important points from everyone. And I think I'm kind of in the middle as well on, <laughs> I think some some approaches we could adapt, but others need to be thrown out the window and they're not gonna work because they haven't worked in other contexts. Um, but I, I wanna thank all of the panelists. I wanna thank CTED, everyone who's joined. This is such a dynamic conversation. I personally have learned a ton. So very grateful to be invited to, to moderate. And I wanna hand it over to CTED if you have any closing remarks you wanna add before we officially close. Just thank you, David and C Ted, for for looking after us. It's been great, and you and, and the panelists, of course. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, just a few a few closing remarks from me. And unfortunately, you've all done such a great job in in both summarising your own remarks and and Emery to the moderation. There's not really too much more for me to say other than to echo those thanks um, to Emery to to the panelists and to the audience for some really great um, insightful questions. And yeah, it's been a real shame we couldn't get to to all of those. Um, we'll send a follow-up email after this event with details of the open briefing of the CTC, which is happening on Friday morning uh, at 10 a.m. And I, I can't really think of a better way to prepare for that conversation uh, than the conversation we've had today. Um, some really important insights that I think will be will vital as part of both Friday's discussion, but I think the discussion on this moving forward. So we've obviously heard a lot about how international this problem is, both uh, from Castro in terms of the travel and the interaction between different groups, but also the online element, which I think has been key throughout um, everyone's remarks uh, and looking at those new platforms and new challenges. We've heard a lot about the, the questions of terminology and I think being distinct about the different groups and, and not necessarily labeling them all as one, uh, which I think is a challenge and something we identified in our own uh, trends report. We've heard about the, the loan actor question and I think how that uh, intersects with the questions of designation and some of the, the methods that have traditionally been used at the international level um, in a CT context. We've heard a lot about the gender dimensions and, and particularly the, the role of masculinity, um, which I know is something that CTED is going to be looking at um, over the next few weeks uh, and moving forward. And then obviously heard from Tom about the, the finance question and some of the gaps and challenges there. So I, I think you know, as, as, as in many things, the more we learn, the more we realize um, how, how little we know. Um, we've heard a lot about gaps, and I think we've heard a lot about challenges in particular, um, something we didn't hear too much about today, but we will hear about on Friday is the, the question of CV pro programming and interventions and how best to address that issue. And it was really interesting to hear um, how passionate the different panelists were um, in relation to that question about whether or not we can copy and paste our responses from, from different forms of terrorism. And I think some of these questions are going to be really key as we look forward to what the role of the UN is specifically, but the role of the international community um, in addressing all, all of these challenges. So all that's left for me to say is, is to thank you everyone again. Please do get in touch with CTED if you're working in this space, whether as a practitioner or a policymaker, a researcher, obviously particularly uh, interested in hearing from you. Uh, and we really hope that this is, is the beginning of the conversation that will continue on Friday. I know there's a, a fantastic event being planned uh, next week as well, a virtual event by the UK and US missions here at the UN that I'm sure will be really, really interesting. So this is hopefully the beginning of a really interesting conversation and, and thanks to all of you for your insights. Thank you. So um, again, Thank you so much. I guess I can officially close. I'm grateful for, for all of your insights and looking forward to the CTC briefing tomorrow and, and events coming up so that we can we can continue hashing this out and having these discussions and, and, and great job again for everyone.